Welcome back. We're here with more of my conversation with Mario Mendonca at TD Cowan. I asked him about CIBC's results and its exposure to U.S. real estate. Well, I think everybody has U.S. commercial real estate exposure. You can see that across the groups. I'd say national would be light in that respect, but everybody else has a lot of commercial real estate. And so does CIBC. What I was observing there is that CIBC's growth in U.S. commercial real estate was especially strong. Mm. I think it was 2021, 2022. That means something to me because often the loans you put in, um, the most recent loans you put in could, that you originate could be the ones that cause you the most heartburn down the road. So I was really observing there that CIBC may have some U.S. commercial real estate exposure that will lead to charges. In fact, this quarter, they did take some charges in the U.S. commercial real estate. I think they were manageable or modest, but they did take some charges. Um, I did do a stress test in my last research report where I, I assumed some fairly high cumulative loss rates in commercial real estate in Canada and the U.S., particularly in the office space. What I conclude from that is that every bank could see a bit of a hit to their capital. But I also believe that that hit to the capital would be manageable, especially because the banks are always producing capital every quarter anyway. So U.S. commercial real estate or commercial real estate generally could lead to some charges and some pressure on capital. But I, I think our banks have the, the capacity to absorb it. Hmm. I, I want to get make sure I get in National Royal. So National, what are you seeing there? Nationals uh, performed extremely well over the last few years. Um, they've really defied gravity in my view. What I'm getting at there is their very strong Cambodian business has been growing the top or growing loans at 30 to 40 percent a year. It's become a very big part of this bank. What I, what I did notice this quarter, and I've kind of started to see this over the last few quarters, that the margins on that business are compressing. Um, 60, 70 basis points sequential decline in their overall net interest margin in Cambodia. That's because deposit costs are getting higher, and I believe perhaps even competition is kicking in. What I find especially interesting about National and their Cambodian business is while they're growing their loans at that pace, we're not seeing any meaningful in increase in credit losses. So either Cambodia is just the best place to have to be a bank where you can grow your loans at 40% without credit losses, or that's something we'll see down the road. And I'm taking the view that at some point, National is going to have to slow the pace of growth in Cambodia. Last one is Royal. Uh, and you also alluded to earlier that expense growth was something that you were watching with the banks and you, you highlighted again with Royal specifically. Yeah, bar none, no bank is growing expenses faster than Royal. And at the, the near the end of the call, the conference call, the CEO Dave McKay did acknowledge that the bank overhired, particularly in the tech space, on the presumption that there would be significant attrition of employees as the tech big the tech big tech companies in the US competed for employees. The big tech companies, in fact, started letting people go, and that's led to much lower attrition for Royal uh, uh, for their employees than they expected. And as a result, their expense base is really elevated. My view is really that our banks never budget out expenses without also taking into account what the revenue picture is like. And I think what happened is the revenue picture slowed down perhaps more abruptly for our banks than they anticipated. And that's what led to this very high expense growth relative to the, to the revenue growth, which is what we refer to as operating leverage. And I think that's what really ultimately resulted in Royals operating leverage looking so weak. They may have um, underestimated the abrupt decline in margins. Last question, Mario. Um, a couple of things you, you mentioned, just when you take a look at the, uh, the banking sector overall in your report, you talk about you're not pricing in you know, a deeper credit cycle, more normalization, which you talked about. But you also highlighted that, and I, I know that lots of questions are out there, when are these variable mortgages going to uh, interest rates on variable mortgages is going to start hitting people and hitting spending. And you highlight the fact that a lot of these won't be resetting until uh, 2025, 26. So mortgage payments are already moving higher for banks like Scotia and National, where the structure of their variable rate mortgage is, uh, results in a, in a quarterly or, or very frequent adjustment in the mortgage payment. Now, for, bank, for the other banks, rather than the mortgage payment adjusting, the term of the of the loan extends, the, the remaining term um, amortization term of the loan extends. And in fact, for several of these banks, we're seeing that the remaining amortization term is already uh, a good portion of the loans, like a quarter to a third of the loans, their mortgage loans have remaining amortization periods beyond 30 or 35 years. Mm -hmm. Now, for those, those banks, those banks where the mortgage payment doesn't adjust, the monthly payment doesn't adjust, when those mortgages mature, uh, probably around 25 is when we'd see the majority of the maturities. 
that's when the mortgage payments expand. But here's an interesting thing. Why is it? Why haven't we seen more defaults or credit pressure for those two banks like Scotia and National where their mortgage payments do adjust? This is the sort of tricky part. You would have expected that those banks would be the canary in the coal mine where we'd see the, the delinquencies emerge. It hasn't happened. So why is it? Why are Canadians able to absorb these significant increases in their mortgage payments? Could it be that wage growth has been very strong and, and allowing them to absorb it? Could it be that they've just had some success in paying down their mortgages over time? Could it be as simple as loan to values remain very, very low because housing prices is, are high? So this is one of those areas, residential mortgages, where folks like me were constantly wringing our hands, worrying about the implications to the residential mortgage market, but it never plays out. And, and by the way, this has happened before. There have been periods in my history covering banks where I've wrung my hands worrying about a particular mortgage or loan class and the losses never emerge. Mm -hmm. So be very careful. When our banks say they're comfortable with their exposure, um, I think it's wise to take them at their word. That was Mario Mendonca, Managing Director at TD Cowan. And for full disclosure on all the companies mentioned uh, by Mario, please go to the link up on your screen. Up next, should you pay off your mortgage before retirement? Nicole Ewing of TD Wealth looks at the factors you should be thinking about.